Hi, welcome to another Tuesday night rheumatology for Room Now. I'm David Liu from Melbourne, Australia, and this is all part of the PMR months, the PMR campaign for Room Now. Make room for PMR. We've had an enormous amount of content this month. Really started to explore a lot of the um, uh, areas which we haven't really talked about as a broader rheumatology community enough. Um, but I think are really critical for the second most common rheumatic inflammatory disease um, and really an underspoken burden that we've got. So I've really been uh, grateful to the editorial staff for who have been behind this month, in particular, my co-editors, Sebastian Satui and Sarah Mackey, who joins us today. Also very grateful to Sanofi for supporting the whole month. Um, supporting the whole month with absolutely zero direction on what we should do and so we've um, had fun putting together a month which we thought would interest you as a listener and would um, be something which would stimulate a lot of discussion within uh, the realm of polymyodramatica. This is the last Tuesday night rheumatology. Uh, we, just to take you back to that journey, the first one we talked about diagnosis and monitoring, the second one we talked about steroids, third one we talked about steroid sparing agents, and really tonight we get to have the most fun um, with three great thinkers here. So tonight we're talking about controversies in polymyodramatica. And there are certainly some controversies. We won't, we've only got an hour, so we'll, we won't get to explore everything, but certainly we'll get to explore some really interesting areas. Um, and welcome, of course, to all those of you who are listening in live. Um, if you're on the live stream, please remember to ask plenty of questions in the Q&A box, in the Q&A box. Um, we obviously thrive off the dynamic discussion, but also um, hello to, to all of you out there listening on the replay as well. So the three great thinkers I've got in polymyalgia and rheumatica here with me today um, probably need uh, no introduction, I think, but I'm going to get them to introduce themselves um, in turn. Uh, so uh, to, to tell you who they are, for, as if you're just listening on the audio, Dr. Calabrese, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, thank you, David. Uh, Len Calabrese. I'm just a just a country rheumatologist from <laughs> from the Midwest. <laughs> uh, so, hey, I, it, you've had such big fun, uh, you guys, on all of these. I, I, it's been a it's a great pleasure. You know, I, I come uh, from uh, 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 the Vasculitis uh, Center for Care and Research at the Cleveland Clinic, and. Uh, this is just a, 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 a condition, a disease, a disorder that is just in the center of it all. And, you know, just one of the great joys of rheumatology to take care of. Okay. And when I think about um, great thinkers in our rheumatology world, I think about you, Lynn. So I'm really glad that we've got you here today to go through some difficult areas. Now, a, a fountain of expertise as well. Uh, Dr. Wolfgang Schmidt, thank you so much for joining us today, even though it's 1 a.m. in Germany. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, great to have you all here. Um, I'm a rheumatologist from Berlin, Germany. Um, uh, this is actually my place here, the, the view from my from the window of my office, although nice. it's not as bright uh, as on the image uh, currently. Um, I'm particularly interested in giant cell arthritis and PMR, um, uh, in ultrasound, um, and, uh, well, we see lots of patients, uh, it's really, um, hospital providing patients, uh, patient care. It's not so much, um, university centered, although I'm teaching in the university and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Wonderful. And, um, another GCA PMR expert and my co-editor, uh, Dr. Sarah Mackey, um, please introduce yourself in case anyone doesn't, hasn't heard from you this entire month. Hi, I'm Sarah Mackey. I'm a rheumatologist from Leeds, and my interests are giant cell arthritis and polymyalgia rheumatica. Now, I am really keen to hear from all three of you as to what you think the burning controversies are in polymyalgia rheumatica today. Uh, today, now I know that we've sent out a survey, and we've really looked to address a few different things, which we'll go through today about pushing the boundaries and diagnosis, about lumping and splitting about what role rheumatologists and, and primary care should play and how that should work in, in tandem, and then the role of CSD in this 2023 um, post-SAFA world. But um, I'm really keen to hear from the three of you what you think the, the big controversies are 
in polymalogrammatica at the moment. So maybe I'll go in reverse order. Dr. Mackey, what do you think? Uh, so I think it's all about boundaries, and I'm going to come on to that a little bit later. Indeed, and we have got some slides that Sarah will present very shortly. Dr. Schmidt, what do you think? I think there are lots of uh, controversies. Uh, first, uh, is the diagnosis clear? It's not so easy and clear to diagnose, like a gastric ulcer, for instance. Uh, I think we, of, of course, have also a lot of controversies uh, regarding treatment. So I'm really looking forward to a lot of uh, serious and hard discussion and probably some controversies among us as well, hopefully. Hopefully. Well, it's very boring when we all agree. So, I, you know, we only get forward from uh, kind of uh, dissecting the issues with uh, opposing views. Dr. Calabrese. Um, I, I'm sure I have. It's hard to add pebbles to this pile. Uh, you know, the lumping splitting obviously is you know, on everybody's mind. But I, I, I'm still, I, I, when I think of these conditions, you know, I still think how little we know of the immunopathogenesis. I mean, we understand pathways that are involved, but why do we get this? And you know, what 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 is the what is the trigger? I, and you know, my interests are in infections and rheumatic diseases, and this has been beaten into the ground. You know, so I I still think about it in that uh, vein as well. I mean, and that is really one of the big questions we all wonder. I know that Sarah has written a lovely uh, blog on the website, which I think doesn't necessarily answer the, the question in, in finality, <laughs> but certainly does explore some interesting things as well. Um, so I will get Sarah to um, present some slides in a second. I will bring them up on screen uh, for those of you playing along on, at home on the screen, um, just to show you that with the survey questions before we go to... Um, the, the, the controversies, uh, we've uh, once again, the day before, thrown out the survey, 226 responses. And we're always really grateful that in such a short time, we get so many answers back. And right across the world, um, uh, obviously mainly, mainly from the US, 62% uh, from the US, but um, scattered right across North America, South America, Europe, um, Africa, Asia, and um, Australasia as well. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, so, so I'm going to get you to talk a little bit about boundaries, because I think when we talk about diagnosis, when we talk about lumping and splitting, when we talk about where rheumatologists versus primary care sit, and when we talk about CSDMRs versus cerulemab and other uh, potential advanced therapies in PMR and steroids for that matter, we're talking about boundaries between things. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you think about it? So in medicine, we need concepts of disease. Um, we need our labels, we need to describe everything inside our defined boundary, and we need that common understanding so that we can share our knowledge and so that we can um, function as a medical community and advance knowledge. But over time, the boundaries of diseases can move. We could say they evolve. Um, so next slide, David. Can you move it on? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. can you see um, so the boundaries can shift quite suddenly. So this normally happens when a new technology comes in. So the first new technology that came in for PMR was the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And that was really the key to the diagnosis um, at that time. Um, and then, of course, another technology that came in was corticosteroid therapy. Um, and I think that's done a lot to shape our ideas of PMR um, ever since that time. Um, and there have been some new tests and treatments since those days as well. Um, but then we always have drift. So um, as individuals, we accumulate expertise as we keep seeing patients and we learn from our patients. And as a community, we teach each other um, and we share our knowledge. And each generation retells the same story in its own way. Um, and so as the context gradually evolves, then sometimes the way we think and talk about diseases can evolve as well. So next slide. So what do we do when those boundaries move and they come to overlap, particularly when they didn't overlap before? And then what do we do for those patients that sit at that intersection where they could be said to have one disease and they could be said to have another disease? Do we say that they have two diseases at once? 
do we say these two diseases are actually the same thing? They're different manifestations of the same multi-system disease? Or do we say they're sort of adjacent or related disease or they're on a spectrum that they're sort of next to each other, but not quite the same thing? Um, so this is these are really good questions and these are difficult questions. And to, to an extent, they're due to the fact that we have to have labels, but they're really important questions. Um, and the reason is, if we come to the next slide, because we always got to remember that the diagnoses we use in medicines, they're just handles. Um, a doctor makes a diagnosis and that opens the door for a patient to go through to a specific care pathway. And so these diagnoses have got social functions. They determine reimbursement. They determine quality standards, clinical guidelines, and they frame our education and knowledge. So we've just had a whole month about PMR. And we all think we know that we're talking about the same disease, but it's really important that we are because otherwise we can't share information, we can't update our knowledge. But we've always got to remember as well that our, as Len said, our understanding of what causes PMR is very imperfect. So how do we know that it really is one disease? And maybe in future we'll have better taxonomies of disease, maybe molecularly defined taxonomies like you know, coming in in other areas of medicine. And our ideas about what PMR is might be very different in five years time. But for now, we've got to go with what we've got. And the best we've got is the gold standard of clinical diagnosis based on expertise and experience and teaching and tests and treatments, all those things that we have. So next slide, please. This is my last slide. So I think the controversies in PMR often do relate to those boundaries. Who's inside the boundaries? Who gets diagnosed and who is outside? have these two diseases now almost converged into one entity um or do we just say they're just next to each other they're just adjacent or maybe overlapping a little bit and what's the pmr diagnosis mean in 2023 for referral pathways where do they go who which doctors do they see how do they how does their journey of care progress and what's the diagnosis of pmr mean for treatment options what treatments do they get should they get could they get um, and how do we saw the, see all this changing over the next five to 10 years? And now I'm going to hand you back to David. <laughs> I'm going to hand to Len at that point, because I'm really interested in his thoughts. I think he's probably thought um, at least as much as, as if not more than anyone about, um, about taxonomies and thinking about how we deal with this conceptually. So how does, how does that all sit with you, Len? How does that resonate? Does that, um, and what do you think that means for, for PMR? Well, I mean, I, I I agree with the 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 flow of of of, of thinking on this. Um, you know, I do believe that you know, it, and from a clinical perspective, um, that you know, PMR and GCA at the at 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 at, at the 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 polar extremes, uh, you know, do seem you know. Uh, uh, a lot different to both clinically, prognostically, et cetera. Uh, and I'll also, uh, you know, as all, all of us are always struck that, you know, in the middle, you know, those boundaries uh, have become far less clear. Um, the question is, is that, you know, because we're using a clinical diagnosis, you know, is this sufficient to, you know, allow us, you know, uh, Clarity and taxonomy. Um, I think from a, from what we do for our patients, by and large, it works well because every time you see a patient with this disease, you ask two questions: one, is it PMR, uh, or is it something else that I goofed up and I missed? And secondly, if it is PMR, do they have GCA? That's the only two questions that we really have. And then we get down to you know our conundrums of, of therapy. So after many decades, I'm still asking those questions. I think I'm a little bit better than I used to be, but. Well, I'm glad that um, to hear that you don't feel like you've solved it yet, because I feel like I'm completely lost in this ocean of, of thought. Wolfgang, I'm really interested in your thoughts as well. I mean, you've obviously, um, you know, one of your, the world expert in, in um, certainly in ultrasound, and, and giant cell arteries and PMR, and, and more broadly in imaging in giant cell arteries and PMR. Um, uh, I think, um, I'm sure you've got a lot of thoughts about what all of that experience means for trying to conceptualize PMR and GCA and where the boundaries might sit. 
yeah, um, I think it's difficult to diagnose uh, PMR. Um, so being a rheumatologist, some, some things are easy. Rheumatoid arthritis, in many cases, it's very clear. And PMR is uh, sometimes quite challenging. So um, if I look, of course, at my patients with PMR, um, about 15% of pure PMR without any symptoms of the GCAF. GCAF, I look closely with imaging, I have found 20%. If I look at my GCA patients, about 50% of my patients have PMR. So there is an overlap and there is something. There are a few patients who start with PMR and develop GCA later, and also very few patients probably who have GCA and if they relapse, they may relapse as a, with, a, with PMR symptoms. So there is definitely an overlap. But I think a large, a big challenge is also to see patients with shoulder pain, and that is all. Most, most, the most sympt most common symptom definitely, which brings us patients, um, and they may have other diseases. So like shoulder OA, um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, CPPD. Um, I think also very important differential diagnosis. Um, these are probably the most important diagnosis, and it's um, definitely not so easy to distinguish. I know that ultrasound helps. It's definitely not all, not everything. Uh, we do it. We even do it if we diagnose PMR that we do even a vascular ultrasound. It's definitely helpful to, to differentiate PMR from the other entities, but still there are patients where it's tricky, patients who Finally, if I see them for one year, they may develop rheumatoid arthritis or something else. So I think it's not really very easy, although I see many of these patients. You know, I, I just like to, to punctuate that. And Wolfgang, I agree 100% with what you're saying. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I'll just throw this out. You know, for the patient that I see with PMR that a year later, I think has rheumatoid arthritis, it's really not that big a deal uh, to me. The patient that I think that has PMR that winds up having bacterial endocarditis, that's a big deal. So there, there are gradations within this um, uh, of, of, of our, you know, the, the, the costs for our diagnostic uncertainty. Oh, absolutely. I mean, part of this, uh, like, like Sarah said, these are handles to try and understand and, and but there are consequences from this. So I think keeping all of that in mind, I'm going to move forward to some of the survey questions and really invite some discussion. Firstly, a little bit about that, that about diagnosis and the boundaries that we set for ourselves and what those really mean. So we asked some survey questions. Um, so what is the youngest age? We asked you, what is the youngest age you were diagnosed PMR with typical PMR symptoms and, and, and elevated inflammatory markers. Uh, and once again, these questions are deliberately leave a little bit of scope to be in, interpreted because we want to see the, the spread of thinking here. So 68% of you said 50, which is what reflects the classification criteria, once again, used for um, entry into clinical trials rather than necessarily for diagnosis. Um, so 14% uh, said 60. Um, and, a, and a couple of percent said 65, but 10.8% um, of you said 45, and 5% of you said 40. So um, I'm just going to flick through to the next one just to give some background as well. Can you diagnose PMR on clinical symptoms at uh, uh, clinical symptoms and laboratory grounds? Uh, and 90% of you said no imaging is needed, further imaging is needed, but others have um, opted for shoulder ultrasound definitely or potentially in certain contexts. And then um, we asked an older patient has typical PMI symptoms and signs, but the CRP and ESI are normal. What would you do? And so 56% of you, 56.9% of you said empirical trial of steroids. And then the others were distributed amongst ultrasound, repeating labs, waiting, observing that true rheumatological characteristic or um, ordering PET CT or MI in a couple of percent. So I think this really asks some broader questions about where, how firm are the boundaries that we've previously set for things like classification when we go to something like diagnosis and, and think about that. So I'm interested in what the panel thinks about age and polymyodramatica. Sarah, I might go to you first. 
What do you think, does, does that surprise you about the, the, the spread of ages for PMR diagnosis? And what do you think about that? I'm a little bit surprised at the people who said 65. I'm not, that seems a little unusual to me. I am not surprised that people went down to 40. And, you know, I, you know, myself, I, I answered the survey and I put down 40. I, you know, I, if, if it was absolutely barn door PMR and there was some imaging as well, then I would, I, you know, I would potentially be prepared to make a diagnosed PMR at that age. Um, it's a bit unusual, a bit on the young side, but, you know, it is possible because I think that, you know, how does the immune system know exactly how old you are? <laughs> That doesn't make biological sense to me. And I think we should evaluate patients based on their clinical features, their clinical presentation, the history and the examination and their tests that we do. And if all those are fitting and the age is a little bit different, then it, I think it doesn't make sense to me to have an exact, you know, a cutoff unless we're saying, well, the social consequences of diagnosis under 50 are so dreadful that to be diagnosed with PMR under the age of 50, it's so bad that we can't possibly let people have that diagnosis. We've got to call it something else. But I'm not sure that that really serves patients well. I think if it looks and behaves just like PMR, then why don't we just call it PMR, even if they're under 50? Um, but I accept that's controversial and not everyone agrees with me. Yeah, interesting. I would have put 50. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I have patients where I ma made the diagnosis something like 45, 46. Actually, my youngest GCA patient is 44, but I did two tests and I would also do more tests and would probably go on treating this patient and not sending this patient, uh, send this patient back to a, a GP, which I like to do with at least some, with some patients with PMR. Um, so um, I think it's tricky under under 50, but uh, there are s single patients, definitely. Wolfgang, can I ask you, do you see changes in the presentations of your PMR and your GCA patients, but primarily your PMR patients as across that spectrum of age? Are those patients who are under 50, um, do they look exactly the same as those who are 50 to 60, say, and then those over 60? Are there associations you see there in your practice? Uh, in fact, uh, I have very, very few out of, if I think about GCA, there may be three patients out of 1,200 um, who are younger than 50 and uh, PMR is very, very few. Um, in GCA, I see, I see a difference. Uh, it's more, more patients with large vessel GCA, that means extra cranial GCA, who are a little bit younger and a little bit more females. Um, otherwise, um, I, I personally, I'm not aware of so many differences between, for instance, a PMR patient with 58 years or 75. Um, I think it's mainly the uh, the symptoms, the typical symptoms, which helped me to make the diagnosis as also the survey said. Um, we rely, of course, a lot on, on history and clinical examination. And if I can ask you this, I, and we always hear age is just a number, it's a number that means something, of course. Those GCA patients um, versus trying to reclassify those as, say, tachyasis arteritis, knowing that the classical presentation differs quite dramatically, but um, as sometimes we've gone to age to differentiate the two um, in some circles. Uh, how do you find being able to delineate those in practice? Yes, yes. me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. It is, one interesting thought just came to me. <laughs> I mean, you have also a biologic age, yeah. And if a patient appears to be fifty-two, looking like fifty-two, uh, uh, fifty-two, like looking like forty-two, um, maybe also my my feeling uh, uh, concerning the biologic age plays a role, yeah. So um, not only looking at the number, but also looking at the patient. Um, this is, of course, completely un. un there is there are no data, um, but this is just a feeling from many years of practice. Well, actually, I mean, I think I'm really interested in Lynn's thoughts on the immunology of aging, and um, I guess this idea of physiological age. What do you think about all this? Do you think that a 50 cutoff is a real thing that we should be um, putting in practice? Where do you think physiological age, in essence, might sit in amongst this? Uh, so these are a great question. 
First of all, I probably would have refused to answer this question. <laughs> Secondly, if I did respond to it, I'd probably put 50. And thirdly, I would say this is not the way that I think. Um, I'm a Bayesian thinker. And what you're just asking is how does age influence pretest probability? You know, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you guys probably don't know who Marty Samuels was. Marty Samuels was one of the great, one of the greatest teachers of clinical neurology um, in, in, in modern era of, of, of United States medicine. He just, and I heard Marty speak so many times and, and we interacted over CNS vasculitis. And he said, you know, Len, he said, I've made a lot of money in my days. And I said, how'd you do that, Marty? He said, well, every time the resident would come and said, we have a, a consult about rule out CNS vasculitis. He said, I'll bet you a dollar it's not. Because that's the way that it goes. So every time somebody says, I have a 42-year-old patient with, with PMR, I said, I doubt it. So uh, I, 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 that, that, so that's that part. The physiologic aging, uh, aging, you know, there's a lack of uh, an autoimmune signature in PMR and GCA. There's not autoreactive B cells, there's not autoreactive T cells, intense inflammation. And what is the what is the major risk factor? Age is the major risk factor. It's incontrovertible. Um, you know, all the things that go along with aging and the exposome, you know, accumulation of the different types of infections, the, the number of infections, the load of infections, as well as um, the tremendous differences in immunologic aging across a population. Mark Davis from Stanford, who studied this more than anybody in the world, shows that you know, identical twins um, age immunologically virtually identical only till they're about four or five years old. And then it starts to differ. Um, and immunologic aging is a stronger predictor of all-cause mortality than the Framingham risk score for cardiovascular disease. So, you know, the, a, a, a milieu of aging you know, immunosenescence and attendant biologic changes is somehow wrapped up into this thing intimately. And we just haven't been clever enough to figure out about it. So um, Dr. Horrocks asks a question uh, about whether maybe, and I guess it goes along with this idea of Bayesian thinking. He says, with the lesser frequency of diagnosis under 50, should we not be looking at alternative diagnoses and almost having it as diagnosis of exclusion? And I guess it gets this idea that maybe we wouldn't exclude a diagnosis below 50, but we might think about it differently. Does that kind of, does that gel? Sure. With? with low pretest probability, then the burden of proof is higher. Hmm. You know, I mean, you have a, a, it looks like PMR, low pretest probability, the patient's, you know, 44 years old or something like that. And then you give them 15 milligrams of prednisone and they're kind of okay. Like, okay, I'm stopping right now. I'm out to full full court stop um, to reevaluate. It, it you know, it's a it's a it's an, a a a a, a multi layered uh, decision making process to me. So I'm gonna if we if we're going to think about Bayesian thinking, maybe we should try and introduce more data points, and we should think about. Uh, where imaging sits in amongst it all there. So that middle question, we're asking about what the role is of imaging um, in amongst diagnosis. I think the question's deliberately not straightforward to answer. Um, maybe I can ask uh, both Sarah and Wolfgang how they feel about whether imaging might help to um, delineate things um, in, in uncertain circumstances a little bit more readily. Wolfgang, I might ask you, um, how does imaging help you in PMR practice, especially as I think Dr. Barbosa here says, trying to differentiate those patients with a shoulder pain like you're talking about who might come up, get it from uh, non-inflammatory causes um, but might still have an elevated ESR. How might imaging help in that context? And do you think that this is a critical factor in trying to understand the boundaries of what we term as diagnosis? Yeah, I love imaging and I love ultrasound. And uh, as I do it myself, it's um, very fast. Uh, I don't have to order it. I don't have to do uh, much pa paperwork. I just look at the patient with ultrasound. And for me, it's part of the clinic examination. 
and it helps a lot to differentiate, for instance, CPBD and uh, OA. Um, also, maybe RA, yeah, if, if there is some swelling of other joints. Um, it helps me uh, to do um, uh, to detect giant cell arthritis uh, to confirm. And then if it's giant cell arthritis, for me, it's a much clearer situation. Um, well, there are other imaging techniques like PET-CT. Um, interestingly, in the German Rheumatology Journal, Zeitschrift für Rheumatologie, that's the name, um, <clears throat> there was a, a um, nuclear medicine physician who suggested PET-CT for every patient with suspected PMR. Um, probably most of us would not um, uh, agree with this. And also, uh, actually, we wrote a, a, a letter uh, arguing against this uh, because of costs and also availability. Um, uh, but actually, you, you, you see a very, very typical pattern with PET-CT um, and, of course, in part also with ultrasound. Um, so actually, it helps to understand the disease, to, to know that there is a, dis a typical distribution of inflammation uh, around the body, around the shoulders, around the, uh, the spine, and usually the pelvis area as well. So um, I think it's very helpful, and it helps me to make the diagnosis of PMR clearer. I guess in those intermediate pretest probability patients, imaging can be so useful in trying to bring things one side or the other when we've got these slightly atypical factors. I mean, Sarah, maybe I can ask you, and I guess also with this next question in mind, what happens when the ESR and CRP are normal? Can imaging help us there? Where do you think the imaging it is going to land in the overall diagnosis um, algorithm of PMR? Because I think we seem to be at this point of evolution at this point in time. Mm. So um, we could quibble a bit and say, well, what do we mean by normal? So there are some older papers that say our ESR of less than 50 is normal in an older person. And that's not true for our labs. Um, so that may be laboratory dependent and you may have to look at your local laboratory range. But if we're assuming what I call normal, <laughs> um, if the blood tests are truly normal, I'm not sure I would necessarily go straight into treatment at that point. I think I would, it depend, and it would depend very much on the clarity of the clinical picture. So if it was extremely clear on history and examination, it didn't look like anything else at all, I might or might not give a trial. I think, I think that is difficult I think it it's one of those you know the the rule of thumb which the rule of thumbs are you know just you know not universal and not to be taken as rules for all time but if you've got an unclear clinical picture like for example if the history is a little bit unclear um because maybe the patient's finding it difficult to um give you the history in the form that you need to be hearing it for whatever reason, then if they've got kind of two out of three of kind of typical age, typical inflammatory markers and imaging, then that makes it a bit easier to make that diagnosis. But if they haven't got the inflammatory markers, it's very reassuring to have a positive imaging test if other things are a bit unclear. But it's this Bayesian approach again. I think if you can shift your probability over that tre treat do not treat threshold and you're sure enough that you want to try some treatment then that's great and then but for some cases you are going to need some an imaging test in order to do that if the inflammatory marks can't get you over if the history and examination can't get you over and you're still in a state, state of uncertainty then you have to do another test or you wait to see what happens and maybe the inflammatory markers will rise but you know i'm i i i do feel um, I do feel worried about diagnosing it when the picture is very murky because the risk is that you miss something that you wish you hadn't. And that's what we all fear as rheumatologists. We don't like PMR mimics because we're constantly worried that we're going to be fooled and caught out by um, a PMR mimic coming and looking just like PMR because these things happen, you know, and it does happen. So, so it's sort of where you sit and where your comfort levels sit. And I think for me, that's just constantly evolving as well as I see more patients and I, I get more experience. And I think that it would probably be different for me in five years from where it is now. But at the moment, I like to get imaging if I'm not sure. Uh, I completely nice. agree. It's like, uh, like the situation with the young uh, people. It's, it's extremely rare. It exists. 
but I have to be very careful uh, not to overdiagnose patients with PMR. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's particularly pertinent when we lose uh, uh, maybe with an IL-6 uh, um, targeted agent that we might lose our capacity to see um, uh, more sensitive changes in ESR and CRP. Certainly, Dr. Mer Merchant asks, are there any other tests for PMI, ESR and CRP, and non-specific if a patient has multiple medical problems? And I know that some of that um, spin-off work from GIACTA and giant cell arteritis has suggested things like haptoglobin and fibrinogen might be useful. There's some historic data on that. But Dr. Madison said to me this early this morning that, um, well, my time, that um, we really are searching for that biomarker. I guess, does anyone out here think that there might be something else that might help, might be a, a key factor in trying to differentiate some of these difficult cases in the future? Well, maybe a single biomarker is not going to be enough. Maybe we're going to need a panel of biomarkers. Mm -hmm. um, or My maybe concerns are not as much for people that have a clinically suspicious presentation and stone cold um, acute phase reactants. I mean, my 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 greater I mean, and that does occur. You know, the uh, Irving Kushner, who was the dean of CRP biology, uh, who's still alive and kicking, uh, said there is no normal CRP, and you know it's a dynamic. It's a dynamic marker. My greater concern are people that don't have perhaps either a classic clinical presentation or a classic response to a reasonable dose of blue corticoids who have elevated acute phase reactions. Those people make me sweat. Um, you know, a person with you know a, a non-detectable CRP, you know, 0.1 and you know, has made an incomplete response. You know, PET CT. I, I mean, is this going to be a, a, a cult malignancy? Is this a disseminated infection? Probably not. But on the other end, you know, when you have an IUO, um, inflammatory disease of unknown origin with some musculoskeletal symptoms, then then I think imaging really is quite helpful. So I'm going to move us along because we've got we 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 go time's running on. I'm really keen to get on to some um, other big issues. I'm going to come back to this PCP versus rooms issue, and I'm going to bring us to this lumping and splitting discussion because I think there's been um, obviously I think there's a lot of thought about this at the moment. So I think part of the background to this is should PMR, large vessel giant cell arteritis, and giant cell arteritis be viewed separately or together? Um, so, I mean, Len, maybe I'll get you to opine on this first. I mean, how do you see these uh, differentiations? Are they important? Are they not important? Um, at what In this thinking about how things sit dynamically, are they important at different stages or in different contexts? How should we be thinking about this? Well, I mean, aside from the, the, the once we've decided that this is PMR, uh, then the second question is, do, do they or do they not have GCA? And you, Wolfgang and um, Sarah can wax poetically about this and how we go about doing that. But once we have access to, you know, an IL-6 inhibitor, because I, I'm, I'm just giving you my clinical uh, assessment. I don't think any of these other drugs of anti-metabolites are worth anything. I, I, I've always had to like convince myself um, repeatedly that they're actually doing something you know, in a given patient, because I've used them um, many times and we did the RAN, the RCTs of methotrexate and GCA and the TNF trials. Um, it's IL-6 and, and glucocorticoids. And so the patients that I've seen that have had kind of suboptimal responses to glucocorticoids in the past five years, uh, I've kind of magically changed my diagnosis to probable GCA and put them on tosylogen. Mm. So, Sarah, I'm going to throw it to you at this point. I know that you wrote this uh, beautiful editorial in the Lancet Rheumatology, I think probably a year ago now, uh, about the shared pathophysiology between um, PMR and GCA. Obviously, um, IL-6 does play an important role in both diseases. Um, what do you think about 
this commonality? What do you think that means for um, for lumping versus splitting and diagnosis? So I think that, yes, they absolutely have aspects of pathophysiology in common. And of course, the IL-6 is the most obvious place to go there. Um, it's sort of very striking when you look at the cytokine patterns uh, and the sort of origin of the diseases in those kind of adventitial tissues, those stromal tissues that um, clues to that from imaging and clues to that from sort of temporal artery biopsies with GCA. Um, that's perhaps a bit more speculative that it starts in the stroma, but it sort of makes sense. And we proposed um, hypothetically, speculatively, that maybe it's to do with kind of mechanically stressed tissues somehow play into that somehow, you know, why does GCA happen in those arteries which are constantly under mechanical stress and being moved? Um, that's all speculative. Um, but the fact is we have to come back to the social function of diagnosis and if, and it's, it's what do patients need? So if we can meet patients' needs and if they, with a PMR diagnosis by itself, with one certain treatment strategy, but we GCA patients have different needs, they need different things to help their symptoms, then that's what it comes down to at the end. And I think what the only way to settle this question really would be to take those patients in that intersection, those overlap patients, do a randomized control trial, treating them as PMR or treating them as GCA and seeing which group does better. Because I guess that's it, that ultimately these labels do have implications for therapy, uh, especially, and we're, we're a little bit uncertain as to how those uh, patients may well, the, the true trajectory of those patients in amongst the steroidosis we force upon them at the moment, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, you could argue it both ways. It might be that they need that GCA dose of steroids because there's, I don't know, there's some GCA um, subclinically, um, but if they've got clinical features of GCA, then I think most of us would be a bit reluctant to you know if they look like clinical gca then at the moment most of us would say that trumps the pmr and we should treat them as gca if they look clinically like pmr but they've got gca features on imaging that's when we should probably be when we're I, when i think we're a bit more in equipoise about how we treat those but again that's controversial because some people would say well if they've got no clinical features of gca but they've got imaging gca then that's gca so that should trump the pmr and we should treat them as gca and you could argue it both ways depending on how you see it and perfect and way to walk down. More, <laughs> yeah and you probably need more <laughs> more prednisone for those patients with subclinical gca um so so i like this uh this this these thoughts about uh, the disease which is a global disease of pmr gca and i think they are very uh, closely related from the pathophysiology physiology side um maybe even more than GCA and uh, Takayasus, where we probably, for instance, know that uh, TNF alpha blockers seem to work for for the disease where they are completely useless in in, in GCA. Um, uh, okay, we can use methotrexate for both, but um, um, many of us use it as we see from the survey. But um, like me, most of you say, okay, small benefit, and that's also my my view, and I'm a little bit reluctant on methotrexate. Um, but we also have, of course, we have a higher dose for, for, for GCA, which is needed. And we have, from the practical side, different drugs. Uh, we have tocilizumab, which is approved for, um, uh, for GCA. We have um, 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 Zylumab, which is approved for PMR in the United States, not in Europe. Um, and we just published this study on GCA and Zylumab, which... Uh, didn't show great benefit of sarilumab, but it was uh, stopped uh, early, so we have don't have much patience where we can talk talk about. But we will not get sarilumab for uh, for GCA. So we have different treatment options, and I think therefore we need to distinguish between GCA uh, and PMR for practical reasons as a rheumatologist. I mean, that study, uh, which has just come out in ART in the last couple of days, really stunning results. Unfortunately, COVID meant that the recruitment wasn't what would have been liked. But I'm really interested, Wolfgang, in your thoughts on right now, what you're doing for those patients who, PMR patients, if you scan them and you see GCA, uh, well, if you see large vessel uptake on ultrasound, what that means for how you treat them right now. What are the fundamental differences between that type of patient 
the patient who you scan and who has no large vessel uptake at the moment? Yes, so uh, first it's a clearer diagnosis, as I said, uh, but I also have a higher dose uh, of um, a start, starting dose of uh, prednisone. Usually I go maybe to 40, depending, of course, on, on the whole situation, CRP, uh, weight of the patient and so on, um, instead of 15 to 25 milligrams per day. Um, I'm, of course, going more forward to IL-6 inhibition if there is a GCA patient. Of note, uh, for PMR, I'll, uh, the, the study, the sufferer study that was uh, done was made on relapsing patients with at least 7.5 milligrams. So it's also not probably for every patient. Um, so um, I, 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 I make differences even in subclinical uh, GCA. <sighs> So do you think that, um, do you th how do you think we're going to find out more Wolfgang for those patients? I mean, uh, uh, do you have plans to investigate those patients more? Do others? Because it seems like even now there's still an important difference between in amongst these, these potential overlap patients that there's between patients who are more on the PMR side of things versus more on the GCA side of things, important therapeutic differences. Uh, there, there was a poster at, at EULA, uh, but it's pre preliminary data from a group from Madrid around Eugenio de Miguel. Um, and they really saw that these uh, pure PMR patients need more prednisone, but we have to wait for the publication. And so Lynn, what do you think about, I mean, I, I, it's been interesting during the week, uh, Mike Putman wrote this um, a blog on, on Room Now as part of our month, um, talking about um, potentially um, the risks of overdiagnosis and maybe overtreatment in certain contexts, um, but there's still obviously that commonality between the two diseases. Overdiagnosis of what? Oh well, I think overdiagnosis of a couple of things, um, potentially overdiagnosis of of other um, uh, incidentalomas and and other things like that, but also with imaging, but then also potentially overdiagnosis of things like large vessel vasculitis and what that might mean for therapy. So, yeah, I mean, where do you think that, where do you see this heading in the in the future? It's, been, it's an exciting couple of years ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is something we all struggle with. As I said, you know, question number two is, do they or do they not have, have GCA? Um, you know, those that have access to, you know, high quality ultrasound, uh, like, Wolfgang does and uh, Siren has access to. Uh, I mean, I think it's entirely reasonable um, uh, to look at head and neck vessels. And I know you can look at subclavians. You know, somebody who has a whiff of a subclavian uptake and nothing else and no symptoms, am I going to totally shift my gears on this? I you know I might go up to 30 milligrams a day to start out with instead of. 15 and, and move from there if I'm very confident that there's no head and neck ischemic symptoms and things are in the symptoms melt away. I mean, it's it's a clinical conundrum that uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say is, you know, very experiential. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sarah, I'll give you an opportunity. Uh, we've heard what Wolfgang would, does in the situation, what Len does in the situation. What do you think it means? And what where do you think this is heading? I think it is difficult to know what it really means and what we should do with these patients. Um, and we don't want to get it wrong um, either way. And that's, you know, the fear of getting it wrong sometimes means we do ever treat because we, we don't want to miss treating something we wish we, we, and so there's, once you know that there is large vessel uptake, large, you know, thickening of the intermediate medial complex of the um, auxiliary arteries, then you right it, it's harder then to, kind of stick to the pure PMR track. Um, so, you know, I think we need better data on how these patients do. We need better data on their prognosis and we need to know better data on their conditional prognosis. So what happens if we treat them one way? What, if, what happens if we treat them the other way? Like ideally a randomized controlled trial, um, but if not, then decent high quality observational data so that we can really start to tease out um, what happens to these patients under various treatment scenarios and 
how how should we be treating them um and maybe there's no one size fits all maybe it's not a case where we can have draw a little diagram about it and they all get follow the same pathway maybe there's more stratification to be done within that and it depends on the individual not just their disease but their comorbidities and their all their other factors as well so um it it's a bit uncertain at the moment i think which way it's going to go um and maybe i think if we had a better uh soluble biomarker a better disease activity marker and a better better biomarkers could differentiate between these two poles of the spectrum whatever we call it then that would also be helpful um and so we're because we're so reliant on history examination imaging and then some very imperfect inflammatory markers that's always going to give us problems um and again you know a, a, a better biomarkers and better validated biomarkers for disease activity would i think be and also for the pmr stroke gca dichotomy would be would be very useful in future. Well, I'm glad that we can all agree that we're not sure exactly what this means at this point in time, but we do seem like we've got an idea of how we might go ahead and might go forward. I'm going to, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to go to um, uh, this question here, which is about the relationship between um, keeping in, in mind all those complexities, keeping in mind we haven't solved polymyalgia and radica, and there are some difficult situations and diff situations to navigate and advanced therapies to, to try and, and figure out when to, and how to apply. What does this mean for the relationship between primary care and rheumatologists? So thinking about um, when, um, so let's look at these survey results. Why are PMR patients referred to you? We asked you, and then about, and once again, this is, was, you had to choose one. So it's deliberately, um, deliberately forced you to answer questions you don't necessarily want to answer, um, but Suspected PMR from primary care, um, half said that was the main that was selected that. 29.9% um, said undiagnosed joint pains, 11.2% said very high ESI and CIP, and really a very small minority nominated studying and managing steroids or studying and managing DMARDs. Um, I think we were split on whether all patients with PMR should be diagnosed and managed with a rheumatologist. Actually, 60% of you answered yes, that everyone should, uh, should um, see a rheumatologist and be diagnosed by a rheumatologist. And then um, is it okay for PMR to be diagnosed and steroids to be initiated by a PC PCP? At the same time, we said 72% of us said yes to that. So some different conclusions from that. Len, thinking about how things sit, especially in the US context, and but then thinking about what we've said about the difficulties in diagnosis at different points, and then maybe the therapies we might apply, how would you respond to this? And and, and do you think what do you see as the role of the primary care physician in the management, the diagnosis and management of polymyalgia rheumatica? I, I think that this is a critical question. And uh, this is profoundly influenced by health systems uh, design. Uh, flow of patients, you know, uh, the United States is not the United Kingdom, uh, nor the Netherlands. And, you know, from what I have seen and read, you know, your, your care pathways are, have been ensconced for some time, and you can tell me how well they work. The United States is kind of the wild, wild west. And uh, I, I don't think that most primary care physicians have the confidence um, either in declarative or procedural knowledge to diagnose and manage with steroids. And they generally will shout out at some point in time uh, for help. I think that uh, this is something that in the United States is certainly needed. Uh, I think that the critical errors in diagnosis uh, can be um, uh, tragic. Um, and now with the widened armamentarium, I think that all patients um, uh, who even have uh, the diagnosis in primary care and may be treated in primary care should have a secondary opinion in rheumatology. I feel very strongly about this. We actually have, I'll just tell you one final thing. We actually are having an active conversation right now as whether, you know, we have a lot of advanced practitioners in our practice. We have 40 rheumatologists in the group and you know, a couple of handfuls of advanced practitioners who are very good. Uh, nurse practitioners, um, um, physicians, assistants, et cetera. Um, we were talking uh, in the past two weeks about making uh, 
you know, at least some type of checkoff of every patient who's newly diagnosed uh, uh, with PMR checked off by a member of the vasculitis center. You know, maybe it may be informal, maybe it's formal, but this is on our radar screen. And these are, you know, advanced practitioners that deal with rheumatic disease. So I have concern. Wolfgang, you talked a little bit before about um, maybe the times when you've confirmed um, diagnosis or initiated therapy, and then some patients might be able to be stratified to come back to their primary care physician, to their general practitioner. I mean, how do you see this landscape? Yeah, I really like to see patients uh, for diagnosis. I like to send patients back. Uh, I mean, we have a problem with resources. This is a general, I think there's a problem worldwide that we don't have enough rheumatologists, for, probably for caring for all PMR patients. But um, it, it, and what I hope and what, what I think would be good is that every patient would be seen by a rheumatologist personally. Um, but once the diagnosis is, is made and confirmed, uh, I, I would like to send the patient back to the GP and the, the patient may come back uh, if, if there are problems with treatment um, or, or with a diagnosis in the further um, uh, course of the disease. Um, but I think it's good because the diagnosis is so difficult uh, that uh, patients may be sent to rheumatologist if possible. And this must be fast because it's really difficult to, to confirm a diagnosis of PMR uh, if the patient is treated. So it's somehow a fast track pathway which will be necessary. So Sarah, I might throw to you on that. Obviously, um, you know, there's a lot to think about from what Len said about the US landscape and, and the initiatives they've tried and what Wolfgang said about and what happens in his practice in Germany. Have you solved this in the UK? And, and then I guess, where is the role for fast track PMR clinics in amongst this? think that we have not solved this in the UK. <laughs> a lot of way to go on our care pathways for PMR. Um, and so sort of I have two thoughts really on this. I mean, my first thought is, um, I just remember back to when I was a very young researcher, and I had to do a talk to members of the public, I was very young and very nervous. And it was about PMR. And um, at the end, a member of the public put their hand up and they said, Well, um, whose responsibility is it to teach GPs about PMR? Um, and I've thought about that quite a long, quite a lot since that time. And I think it's us. I think it's our responsibility as rheumatologists. Whatever we do, whatever those pathways are, we have to treat to teach GPs about PMR better because at the moment we're not doing that well enough, I don't think. Um, because actually what patients need is they need access, they need continuity, they need titration of their medication. And in some parts of the country, that is better done by their GP than just the way that our healthcare system is working at the moment. Sometimes that isn't working very well for them with rheumatology. And sometimes patients are better served by being under a GP for that. Um, but we have to train those GPs to do, to manage those patients and um, someone in primary care at least. So that's for us as a rheumatology community to train those GPs. And then my second thought is I worry as rheumatologists that we are not always, because we don't get referred every patient with PMR in the UK, but I worry that we're not seeing the patients who need us most. I'm worried that we're seeing the patients who are able to navigate the system, who have the knowledge and the health literacy to get to us, and that the patients who need us most never, never get to us. And so we're not seeing, we're not giving the maximum benefit to the patients that we can see with our limited resource, because we, we maybe are not seeing the right patients. So that worries me about our pathways. And I think that um, whether you solve it by saying, well, just fast tracks for everybody, you know, everybody, it, is that possible? I don't know, but for sure, we need to think about how our pathways are working because I think they could be working a lot better than they are right now. Of course, we do have to advocate for our rheumatic diseases to our um, primary care colleagues. We've got so much to think about, um, it really is, uh, behooves us to take on that responsibility. But clearly, I think today, in amongst all the discussion, we've realised how it, it's very evident how complicated this landscape is, how much it's changed over, over recent years. I guess I asked a question to all three of you in turn, do we need more, rec do we need new recommendations, guidelines? How are we meant to navigate this space? Len, I'll ask you, 
Oh, is this now the t- now the time for some greater clarity from learned um, organizations on polymyalgia rheumatica? Oh, I, I think for sure. I mean, this is a time because changing landscape in terms of the way we think diagnostically and expanding our rheumatarian. And that we need to be very nimble. Wolfgang, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, new guidelines are will be on the way soon. And Sarah, I mean, I know the BSL working on some, but it sounds like we need things with broad scope here. Yeah, so um, absolutely, we need an update um, on how to treat this disease because we have had new trials and they need to be incorporated into evidence-based guidelines. So it sounds like it's time for further action and for making room on PMR, dare I, for, for PMR, dare I say. I'm really grateful to these three great thinkers for joining me in an hour discussion today. Um, I've had a lot of fun. I hope you all have too, all those things. I'm sorry I couldn't get all to, to all the questions, uh, but there's so much to talk about. I wish we could go for five hours, uh, but we're not allowed to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Calabrese, Dr. Schmidt, Dr. Mackey. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, see you all around on, on the room now. Um, in the room now uh, environment. We've got um, plenty more still to come. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.